Hello and welcome to this special panel discussion that I have today with a couple of experts in the insurance field uh, that can really help us as accounting professionals when it comes to cyber threats and looking at the insurance angle of it. Because as much as we have so much to really learn, most of us, um, because cybersecurity is a huge topic, I'm not hearing much about cyber insurance or what we can do if all of a sudden something happens or stories about what has happened to others when it comes to a cyber attack because obviously the best is to try to prevent it but then we also need a backup plan in case our preventive measures don't totally work so we have this couple experts, as I mentioned. And so we're gonna jump in and ask a few questions. But first, let me mention our objectives today are to consider why is it important for us as bookkeepers and accountants to look at cyber insurance. And this is not a commercial for that. This is truly an informative session about cyber insurance and what can happen, why we might need it. Also the options that are available to you because it's a fast changing field because cyber threats are growing very quickly as the technology is moving very fast. So it's, it's constantly changing. So it's to find out what we do have available to us. And then some real lessons learned from the trenches, like what's really been happening. And David is gonna share some of that with us. And of course, if Jock has some as well. And of course I've referred to them, but let's meet our panelists. We have Jock Wall with us. And Jock, why, I'd rather hear it in your own words. Uh, who are you and why should we listen to you? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a specialist insurance broker, uh, focus on professionals and professional service firms. Uh, and my expertise really resides on the, uh, on the professional liability policies and cyber liability policies. Um, and so that's, hopefully I can opine on that uh, in our panel discussion today. Okay, excellent. And then we also have David with us. David, I should have asked you, your last name is Trevi, is that correct? Trevi Longy. Okay, very good. Very good. And so same question for you. Who are you and why should we listen to you? Gabrielle, thanks for having me. Um, I'm an attorney in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, for the past 15 years, I've been doing uh, professional liability defense of all types, uh, including accountants, uh, CPAs, and, and bookkeepers. Um, and, and as of recently or the last couple of years, that has uh, uh, stretched over into cyber liability for professionals and the interface between cyber liability and professional e and liability uh, in Kentucky. Excellent, and thank you both for coming. I really appreciate this because it's not, we don't typically have access to experts like you to really give us insight into this area. So I appreciate your time very much in helping us with this. So just a quick disclaimer, as much as David is an attorney, I'm not. And um, this is really just an informational session to help you get insight and start the wheels turning and thinking about how can you protect yourself and what to do if a threat happens. But cybersecurity is really a, a huge topic. So we're really just focusing in on how it affects us as accounting professionals. And when you're ready to make a decision, you really should contact your own expert, professional, lawyer, insurance, uh, accountant, uh, IT professional, when they know your specific situation, because of course we cannot know your specific needs. And then just to get us on the same page here regarding cybersecurity and cyber threats, what they're all about, we're using the definition from Cisco. And it's really the second part of this that we're focusing in on here is these attacks are usually aimed at accessing, changing or destroying sensitive information, extorting money from users or interrupting normal business processes. And Jock and um, David, would you agree with this definition from Cisco? Yeah, I would, um, but I, I don't. The, the 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 aspect of it that that uh, strikes me as uh, somewhat interesting is that they might uh, want to uh, interrupt normal business process. I haven't seen much of that. I, I I've seen a lot of the extorting money and trying mm -hmm. to get the sensitive information, but we don't see so much work from uh, 
uh, hacktivists or people that just want to mm. mess up the situation. It's usually people that are after money or information that can get them money. Interesting, because I actually have. I was just reading about there's certain ransomware that I guess um, isn't really designed to I'm trying to remember the name. It wasn't Wanna Cry, but there's another one that it affected a lot, but it really didn't make how much money. It was an article about how much money they've all made, which was interesting. And then in my own case, uh, on a, fortunately it was a, just a basic WordPress website. I had a defacement hack and it didn't affect anything. There was no problem other than they were just kind of like, see, I did it because I could. So, but those, I, it makes sense well, that we wouldn't necessarily see that in, in your situation because there really wasn't any loss. There. I think it also depends on the industry that you're uh, sort of focusing on. The, the, the threats are so uh, so broad um, that you can't really just um, pigeonhole uh, a cyber threat into one particular industry or one, it's one particular threat. It, and and, and, and the, the objectives of the, the bad actors uh, varies, whether it's to steal information, whether it's to extort yes. you for money, whether it's to gain access uh, to funds through, uh, uh, to, through fraudulent uh, instructions. It just, it really just depends. And, uh, and so I think professional service firms, they tend to, and uh, professionals, they tend to be at greater risk of, uh, from the uh, ransomware uh, extortion, uh, uh, wire transfer fraud uh, element, rather than the loss of information or uh, or a hack that steals uh, social security numbers and and, right. and, and credit cards, um, our credit card information, and 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 the and the latter is really what is generating most of the publicity, just because of the scale of those uh, attacks and the scale of those losses, uh, whether it's Capital One or Marriott, or, and, and the list keeps on growing uh, week or month after month. Um, so it uh, and, and and that adds to the complexity of this whole uh, whole topic <laughs> yes yes it does well so I mean it's constantly changing and growing and expanding so, so let's talk about cyber threats from each of you how do insurance companies view the risks of cyber attack for the accounting profession and I'll go to you jock first on that yeah and, and, and I would just add uh, to to your list of disclaimers uh, that the discussion that we're having today is going to be very insurance uh, uh, centric um, mm -hmm. So, as as your as the audience uh, learns from our uh, from our talking points uh, today, um, you know, keep in mind that the general awareness and the education should still um, should still come first and foremost. Insurance is really a, a, a tool designed to help uh, help arm you as part of your uh, risk management uh, uh, processes and procedures that you can utilize if, uh, if called on. Uh, and so, as you mentioned earlier, this is the, the angle that we're kind of taking uh, on, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on today's panel discussion. Um, yes. Like I mentioned just uh, after you pulled up the, uh, the Cisco uh, uh, definition, um, the risks for, uh, or, or the cyber threats that impact the accounting uh, profession, uh, bookkeepers, accountants, um, they tend to be, they tend to mainly stem, or the, the losses mainly stem from the ransomware or wire transfer fraud uh, type of uh, incidents. Uh, doesn't mean uh, a, a loss of information uh, or a hack um, that, that where, where they steal a sense of information can't uh, occur. It does. Um, part of the challenge is that especially in the small small to, uh, small business world the the companies uh, don't have the same kind of IT, IT infrastructure that when the latter uh, occurs when the loss of when the hack uh, occurs and information is lost the, they 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 may not even um, so when the ransomware or when a first party loss occurs it's right there. It mm -hmm. it prevents them from uh, from running the business. It prevents them from the, the money is gone from the account. So so that tends to that's where uh, the majority of the claims activity uh, is, and that's uh, it tends to also be more of a severity type of loss. Um, but as companies kind of underwrite towards that uh, that risk, and as they uh, tailor the coverages, that is where the main concern uh, stems from from insurance companies. So if you kind of tie it in with uh, with an insurance policy, um, 
the policies vary greatly uh, just in terms of the evolution of the actual uh, cyber threats in the landscape uh, that it's a it's, it's not a very standardized uh, product yet mm. and most of the most of the insurers they will when it comes to social engineering fraud ransomware there's they either exclude those coverages or they sublimit them and try to limit mm. their exposure so, so so that that that's also a sign of okay that's where they see most of the activity that's what they're kind of concerned about uh, especially for the accounting profession interesting interesting so we have to take take a careful look at the policies too then yeah and it's it's difficult and david can probably uh provide uh better insight than i can from a legal perspective but uh um in, including things like the definitions of the policy uh, or what certain threats are called whether it's ransomware or extortion or social engineering fraud uh, versus uh, cyber crime or wire transfer, those type of definitions change from one policy uh, to the next. So, so Interesting. It, it increases the difficulty of, of, of really comparing what you're buying and what you're not getting. Hmm. So, David, what have you seen from your perspective? Because you're on the defense side of it. Side of it, have you seen how the insurance companies have maybe shifted some of what they're seeing as risks in our profession? A, a little bit. I, I want to touch upon something that Jock said. The, he said that most of the, um, um, the indemnity payouts are, are related to um, ransomware or um, those types of things, wire transfer fraud. I think he said that. Um, yeah. and, and I wondered um, how defense costs and the cost to um, get your hands around the claim um, have have impacted that because that's what I see mm. most is if there's no payout, uh, you've got you've got to get your team together. You've got to get an IT investigator who may or may not be your IT professional. Um, you've got to engage uh, an attorney to advise you on um, your potential liability and what you have to do with various attorney generals. If you have um, information for people in far flung states, not just your own yeah. uh, locality. Um, um, you've got to get your hands around whether you have notification duties to those clients, um, and then and then oftentimes uh, the insurance companies have preferred vendors um, who yes. they want uh, the attorney and the and the insured professional to use to do those notifications in a uh, in a manner that 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 manage to get all of the clients and they charge a per piece fee so. I was curious as to whether or not, uh, um, if with these cyber liability policies, there's a sublimit on um, insurance mm. or, or uh, defense costs or cost to defend the claim or get their hands around the investigation of the claim, um, attorney's fees, and whether or not those those are, are becoming more apparent. Because it seems to me, even if there's no actual loss, we must spend a great deal of money to figure out that there's no loss yeah. and get our hands around exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah. From, uh, the, the defense element or the, um, I guess, the traditional cyber coverage, which I would classify as network security and, uh, and privacy um, uh, liability, the, the third party element and the defense costs associated with that or mitigating or rectifying uh, a claim, those I haven't really seen. I think that's become accepted in terms of, hey, this is what the coverage is intended uh, uh, to, uh, to provide. So there's less of a restriction on those uh, um, type of uh, uh, coverages. It's the more frequent or the more, sorry, the more recent type of threats that have evolved. Um, and I'm thinking of social engineering uh, fraud, uh, a phishing scam where a policy, uh, a policy five, six years ago probably didn't intend or contemplate that type of uh, threat and since the mm -hmm. since then the policy had to be tailored and the coverage had to be uh, amended to either excluded uh, to either included or uh, excluded and and uh, and sublimited so um but the the actual defense uh, element um yeah i think that's uh I've, i haven't really seen much of the of, of many restrictions or limitations around uh, that so that's good news for you david Mm. So I guess a, a key thought from this is what you mentioned, Jock, is that basically the insurance companies are have to keep shifting 
with what's Correct. happening with the threats being changing, then they have to look into it to see what's changing and what can we cover, what don't we cover. A quick question on what they exclude. Do they exclude things because it's too much of a risk? What causes them to say, no, we won't cover that? Uh, I think there's uh, uh, the, the, the primary reason is probably because is primary reason is that the coverage has evolved over time. They didn't originally contemplate it. So, and I'll just uh, pick on social engineering fraud in the, mm -hmm. um, in the definition of terms and uh, the coverages. They will say we will cover network security and privacy liability. We will cover the third party element. Uh, we will cover. Uh, maybe rectification or data restoration uh, costs. Um, mm. um, we will uh, cover IT vendor services, et cetera, et cetera. That social engineering uh, type of fraud, just it wasn't an issue uh, or a big issue uh, back in the day. So a policy just hasn't evolved to cover those type of uh, uh, threats. Interesting, now, because to me so, so that's, that seems that, like a whole. It seems yeah, like a whole it, it is a whole. We so, so, so there's, there's a leg servers and hardware on our location. Now, most things are in the cloud. Exactly. So, so, yeah. so think about how how just the how technology has advanced uh, over uh, recently and uh, and how quickly everything's kind of moved to the uh, cloud. So, so there's an element of a legacy issue with uh, actual insurance policies, um, but then there's also the the other part is there's a deliberate there's a deliberate um, decision not to cover or to sublimit those type of exposures or threats because that is where most of the activity is. Uh, mm -hmm. That is where, where they've seen some of the uh, claims. So, um, but in general terms, I would say the market, the, 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 the coverage, the newer policies and newer products that are coming uh, to, uh, uh, to the marketplace, they have to evolve and they have to adapt and they have to be uh, offered. So at the end of the day, if, if a broker kind of recommends, hey, you should buy this policy uh, and it's got a sublimit of 250 grand or this uh, social engineering fraud is uh, excluded versus oh, here's another option where there is coverage, there, there's, there's potential liability on the broker's uh, or the agent side that they recommended the uh, policy that had infinite insufficient coverage in place. Um, so, so there, there's there's that part to where the older and redundant, the obsolete policies just they they they're, they're going to lose traction. Thank you. That is fantastic because it means that the devil's in the details as usual. Although we're detailed yeah. professionals, but we shouldn't just think, oh, I've had that coverage for years. It's fine. We have to be reviewing it and making sure that we have the coverage we need, or we may have a gaping hole in the in yeah. the changes of the threats so very good thank you that was very helpful so let's take a look at that what are some of the options that we have i know before you had spoken to me because you jock you work a lot with small solo professionals as well yeah. um and what is the path that many of us follow maybe from startup to you know a mid-market firm yeah i, I would say in most of uh, most smaller, small businesses, solo professionals, they will probably be more familiar with professional liability uh, insurance uh, rather than cyber liability insurance. As, as we're talking about cyber is uh, more of a uh, recent uh, product. Uh, the take up rate uh, continues to increase, partly driven by uh, the publicity around the big events. Um, mm -hmm. But if, 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 if you as a, uh, as, as a part time uh, bookkeeper or, or solo uh, um, accounting professional um, are looking at your insurance options. Either either you don't buy professional liability or cyber liability. It's likely that you probably have a professional liability uh, policy in place ahead of purchasing a, a cyber liability uh, policy. And, and and I would say at the very least start there. You know the professional liability, as David will explain soon, there, there's overlap with uh, uh, with the, the the cyber threat. What some insurers are, are doing is that they offer an endorsement um, mm. onto the professional liability policy, which means they're extending the coverage to cover some cyber threats. And again, it doesn't mean it, it's it's very basic coverage. I wouldn't. It's it got overall kind of concerns about cyber threats, and you want that wire transfer fraud coverage, or you want that social engineering uh, fraud coverage. It's not going to cover that. Uh, mm. But it gives it, it at least provides some uh, form of coverage. So if you get 
you lose information or there's a data breach, um, then most cases there is a basic form of coverage uh, for that. And then as you kind of move along, you know, the cyber liability uh, policy at standard or uh, a bespoke type of product uh, um, with those coverage enhancements um, is sort of the next uh, uh, step. So you're basically going from don't buy professional liability, professional liability with uh, in a basic endorsement uh, to cyber liability. Uh, very good. And David, what thoughts do you have on this, like the crossover or well, any other thoughts? Uh, well, what I think uh, is interesting is the people that have the, that have come to me um, that have uh, an endorsement on their uh, errors and omissions professional liability policy, they're often surprised how quickly we can blow through that, that amount of coverage that that endorsement <laughs> is. That's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, sometimes as little as $25,000, yeah. uh, $25, which sounds great when you're getting the, the policy and this is an endorsement and it's a it's a freebie and we'll toss it in. Yeah. Um, and then you realize that $25,000 uh, may not cover the, the IT, the outside IT investigation to, to figure out how you got uh, hacked or how you got fished, um, what information was, was breached or uh, was there um, rectification of that notification of your of your clients let alone um, let alone uh, bring in an attorney to advise you or another accounting professional mm -hmm. that experience to advise you so uh, you can blow through $25,000 endorsement uh, that's a tackle on yeah. pretty quickly yeah yeah that makes sense and in that case if there's insufficient coverage then what happens is it that the business owner just has to pay for it out of their pocket because it's still certain things like notifying those who may have been affected. Yeah. You're required by law to do that, right? You are in, in many instances, uh, uh, various states, some a little more ahead of others say that you have to notify, uh, notify the clients. And not only that, you have to notify the state attorney general in a lot mm -hmm. of occasions um, and, and give them the, okay, we know we were, ransomware, we were hacked, here's what we're doing, here's the way changes that we've made um, so that the, the state attorney generals can be assured that you are not a continued risk. Mm. Yes, yes, that's good to know. And a quick question that comes to mind because I have in mind some recent ones in the accounting profession that have been in the news the past couple of weeks. Um, is there any law or ramifications, I guess, I don't know if that's the right word, for when they are aware that there's been an attack to the time that then they notify those who whose information was exposed. Meaning is there a, a, a 90 day, you must notify all of your clients within 90 days or that kind of provision? Yeah, that kind of a thing. Cause I'm, I'm, you know, some of these we hear, oh yeah, it happened back in March. And you're like, hello, why, why are we just hearing about it now? So. Well, in, in my experience, some of the difficulty is even when you bring in the outside IT professional or even use your in-house IT professional, uh, these hacks are very well put together and it's hard to ferret out exactly how the hack happened and determine mm -hmm. exactly what kind of data and information was exposed, if any. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. ransomware doesn't intend to expose your data, it just intends right. to yeah. lock it exactly. up so that it's un inaccessible to you, but it doesn't necessarily get out there and, and go onto the dark or anything like that. So um, the, 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 the answer to your question is, it's probably a state specific question. 50 uh, states, 50 different sets of, sets of laws and, and no overarching um, uh, federal government uh, regulations in that area um, that, that, that tell the states what they have to have. But okay. um, some of the reason for that delay that you're seeing in, in, in the larger hacks and even the smaller hacks is probably, in my opinion, due to the length of time it takes to figure out exactly what happened, exactly what was okay. exposed, get the legal advice of what do you have to do with that information. That makes total sense. Thank you. That's helpful. All right. So moving on, when a claim does arise, what happens when it's discovered? We've kind of talking a little bit about that, but let's hear a little bit more like what happens when ransomware is the obvious one because then all of a sudden i mean they, the software itself tells you that you've been attacked but um is there a specific 
protocol, I guess, that happens pretty much in every case, David? Or, or Jock, well, I mean, either one of you, but let David go first. <laughs> I assume we're talking after you've kicked the plug out of the wall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you're like, ah! <laughs> that it's ongoing. I got to stop that from happening or doing anything else. Um, especially in the course of ransomware, um, uh, before it's even finished, you might see some changes on your files. If you're trying to access mm -hmm. files uh, through some sort of program, you may see that some of your files are, are the names have changed. Um, and then you might catch it in the act before it's completed all of its locking everything up. Um, but obviously getting off the network, turning the machine, turning the server off, uh, uh, turning all the possible points of entry off um, uh, is the first step. The second step is better get on the horn to your IT provider and hope that you paid for the 24-7, 365 uh, uh, response from your IT yeah. group so that they can get their hands around it. Um, from there, it seems like notification to your insurance, uh, your insurance company uh, to invoke the coverage, um, and then getting your team in place to try and advise you, investigate, um, and tell you what you have to do with that information. Um, and, and a lot of people are surprised that it takes, um, because that process is so uh, lengthy, um, getting back to work, being able to turn those machines on and, and, and start your work again. I had a, a, a situation where uh, this happened to a tax uh, preparation client um, towards the end of March with a, an April 15 deadline and a couple of days down, as any tax professional will tell you during that time, is a really bad time to be out of out of business and unable to process anything. Yeah, wow, that sounds like a major nightmare at that point, even if, even if there's coverage just because of the timing. Um, <clears throat> Jock, what about with smaller, like solo professionals who maybe aren't working off of a... a yeah a server, they're just cloud-based, they might even be working from home or working from a very small office or even have contract workers. When something like this happens, what's the general path that they have to follow? It's, it's very difficult because as uh, in practically most, almost all of the uh, smaller firms or um, sole, sole practitioners, they won't, they won't have a written incident response uh, mm -hmm. protocols. They, they just, you don't think about it. You don't. You don't even know where to start putting something together. You can look online and uh, try to uh, craft something, but it's 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 really <laughs> not online it's, with a different computer. <laughs> with a different, yeah. I mean, it, it it it's just not the the preparation piece is just not. Uh, um, it, it's just very difficult to kind of put something uh, together. So if you think about the uh, the, the the three steps of the. Uh, of, um, of risk management where you've got the assess your risk assessment, your uh, preparation, and then the response. It's mm. the, the, the first two, okay, you can do so many things. The response is for, for cyber threats, it, 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 it's, it's really critical because as you mentioned, it's, um, and David said, during tax time, you're down for a couple of days. I mean, that's, it, it's just unfathomable almost. So, the, the the response element for having an insurance policy in place that's where the real value kind of comes out because you can uh, worst case you you don't have your an IT provider that you that you've worked with right. you don't you don't even know where to start you you, you call the carrier and say hey I've got a uh, I've got a claim I've got an issue help me guide uh, help guide me through this uh, through this yes. and, uh, and 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 they will take a very uh, proactive uh, approach to it so. Go ahead, David. J Jocka, one of the things that I, I've noticed is that, um, and, and I only see stuff after it's happened, right? I've, I've not called yeah. in for risk management uh, most of the time, but that most of these, uh, most of the carriers that write this type of insurance do have a stockpile of risk management stuff to help you with. They do. Um, and protocols that you can put in place and the planning. They're very happy to help you on the risk management front end yeah. um, and provide you a lot of substantive uh, material, so I, I thought I'd toss that in. Yeah, no, you, you, you absolutely right. So, so when you think about cyber threats, and, and, and this is where the education also comes in, it's uh, you, you have to look at this, okay, what's what's the risk, what's, uh, what, are the, what are the threats you're trying to manage, mitigate, uh, contain, and uh, and it's not just I'm going to buy an insurance policy and I'll be, uh, I'll be done with it, because there's other elements uh, of these threats that you need to uh, 
uh, need to ma uh, manage and the risk management. So, so the carriers, they understand that and they try to use a better risk, uh, should generate a better uh, uh, portfolio, right? So on average, they, 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 they want to uh, promote it. Where I have for, and, and, and it's great for uh, medium to uh, large organizations which have resource dedicated uh, to that, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to, those, uh, uh, to those initiatives. For sole, uh, a part-time or a solo uh, bookkeeper, they, they may think about it, um, but how practical is it to take a, a template and, and converting it for their own uh, purposes? So it's, but, but you're right, Dave. I mean, the, the general awareness and just kind of thinking about it and working through it and demonstrating that uh, uh, an aptitude towards, uh, uh, towards risk management, it's, that's, that, that's the very first uh, step. And that's why I kind of say general awareness, education, start, start with, uh, with that. I'm not saying don't buy an insurance policy, but, uh, but you really, you really need to uh, uh, need to think about it as uh, in 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 a in a consolidated kind of manner. Yep, Jock, I'm going to put you on the spot. Would you be up for sure. you and I working together to come up with just like a real basic little cheat sheet of here's the steps you should have in place, like your plan, if something happens and you're a solo or small practice yeah. where basically you up to a you know a virtual team what are the things we need to do um and just uh, could be pretty simple just a one page uh, insert uh, insurance exactly. company's telephone number so <laughs> yeah but yes yeah, yeah. I, I mean absolutely i mean that, that, that again from my perspective it just uh, we, we got to recognize who the audience is and just kind of keep it uh, uh simple and practical um so i uh i'm i'm uh, I'm, I'm committed to that Okay, and then do either or both of you, have, <clears throat> excuse me, have a best practice that one that our uh, viewers can walk away with in this case about like what happens when there's an attack? David? Um, I, I agree completely with Jock. Have that, have that phone number for the claims department of, of your carrier uh, uh, right at hand. If you're not covered, um, you, need to, you need to have a plan in place or who you would have uh, help you deal with the situation. Maybe that's your, your IT consultant, if you have yeah. one of those. Um, maybe it's a, a, an attorney that has specialized in understanding uh, cyber liability threats or professional liability threats. Um, maybe it's another CPA that, that, or, um, that, that has gone through the same situation before. Okay. That's great. Yeah, I agree with I agree with, I agree with David. An emergency phone number list, and you can put it in your phone. So if it happens yeah. on computer and also written down paper somewhere. Yeah, I, I agree with David. I mean, the, after 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 the the audience uh, or after someone watches this, spend fifteen minutes just googling who's my local IT consultant in cybersecurity. Who could I? You don't have to reach out to them, but just. Think about it, and oh, who's 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 a local uh, attorney who uh, who's who's an expert uh, in in this field? Um, who can I who can I call um, if something happens? Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, because as they say, forewarned is forearmed, and all those things that say you know an ounce of prevention beats a pound of cure. So we're trying to do the prevent prevention here. So let's hear a few of the stories. I expect that David will have some and and jock you may as well but i want to start with david because he probably has the juicy ones <laughs> what, are, <laughs> what are some oh, of the things you've seen you know uh, some of the ones tie into tie into cyber liability um some of them uh, sort of stand alone but you can see how a cyber liability aspect may play in um i defended a uh, uh, an accounting professional that was doing um i won't call it freelance bookkeeping but it was contract work um, mm -hmm. for, for a small business, a small family business um, that didn't have a lot of controls and uh, had an on-site call keeper. They called her uh, an auditor or a, um, they, audit, they used auditor incorrectly. They used uh, the CFO. She changed her title a lot. At any rate, she was <laughs> embezzling and they, and they, uh, they, they went after um, the contract bookkeeper for not seeing the embezzlement in doing the bookkeeping. Um, and, and financial statements and not comparing uh, 
um, cost of employee overtime or, or uh, where the money was going from the uh, uh, from the petty cash or or that kind of thing. And before they knew it, it was ninety thousand dollars worth of of, mm -hmm. of loss or so uh, before they could even uh, figure out how it was taken over the course of two years. Now, the the liability of the uh, the liability of the the contract bookkeeper obviously had the the, the letters, um, the contract and right. engagement letters. I'm not I'm not looking for this kind of stuff. I'm right. hey, you give me data, I'm putting bad data in your books, that's just the way it is. Um, but she was doing those kind of things remotely mm -hmm. and was um, and was logging in to the the bank accounts of the small business um, and and had the uh, needed every time they changed a bank account or added a new bank account, uh, they would just email her the login and password unprotected. <laughs> Of yours. But um, not only that, uh, uh, one of uh, one of the accountants here, um, we do tax preparation in this firm, um, told me that that um, when she's trying to get into uh, someone's bank account, they often have the third party questions or the security questions if it's right. a familiar familiar computer, and uh, and they're such that she can kind of guess at it. What was your high school mascot? And they can go to Facebook and figure it Look out it very up. quickly. Yeah. Oh. It, and so it's the Trojan, and turns out the answer's right. So uh, mm. putting all that information out there is is some of the things that really make me, you know, get upset and, and bite my tongue. Yeah, before we started recording, I was sharing some war stories with David on things that happen even today um, with one of my clients finally uh, actually following protocol to keep sensitive information secure, which is a first <laughs> for that particular client. So that was good. What about you, Jock? Any uh, any specific claims you can think of for accounting professionals where they were either protected or when things didn't go so well? Um, I mean, David pretty much uh, uh, nailed it on the head. The the, the really the, the the classic one is um, is the phishing uh, kind of scam, and you, and you got to re recognize that phishing is it just it's it's not a, a an an event that happens. At a particular moment, um, it happens over time. So mm. um, the partners uh, email and uh, uh, and they start collecting information about you, um, where they um, where they then uh, they're in your system, and um, and the bad actor pulls the trigger, and uh, they uh, they send uh, send instructions to, uh, to 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 the other party to um, hey send. Send the send the money to this bank account. We're ready for this, uh, whatever it is, real estate transaction or um, the CFO. See, so, so someone needs something uh, um, happen over relatively quickly, and the the, the time frame is uh, relatively uh, short. Um, and then by the time they um, the the professional or the firm uncovers uh, that event, it's uh, it's it's too late. So. Um, yeah, that's uh, to me. That's uh, the, the the phishing scams are um, scary in the sense that it's it's they they're watching you. The bad actors are watching you, and they uh, they're monitoring you, and uh, they they're, they're impersonating uh, you very effectively. Yes, and and, David, and I've seen and I've seen one recently where. Uh, they were in and monitoring uh, on a uh, on an email, um, waiting for a good transaction That's right. that they could in the last minute change of wiring instructions, which is something that that um, ought to be ought to be really near and dear to the to the heart of of uh, freelance bookkeepers that are paying these vendor bills and paying these yeah. paying these transactions as directed. And oh, by the way, last minute change. Yeah, and, he's gone. And, and 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 that's that's what I was. It, it's it just uh, it it happens over time, and you're being uh, watched. Uh, big brothers uh, uh, for big bad uh, bad guys watching you, and uh, and then they time it really well, and then they go in for the uh, for, for for the kill. Yes, they're very patient, which is scary. Yes, yes, and I've had experience. It was a lit. I mean, we caught it, so it wasn't an issue but um, had an experience where basically one of my clients got hacked uh, and it was phishing and um, they were 
looking, watching the emails, saw that I was her bookkeeper and that I paid her bills and they were trying to get me to pay something. And it was like, this doesn't seem right. They didn't watch long enough. I guess they weren't patient enough because it was pretty yeah. quick to, to recognize that something's not right here. Um, we, yeah. So it was all, you know, nothing happened bad. But um, I, David, a question for you having seen these is it de definitely sounds like, um, and from where I sit, the workflow of the bookkeeper or the accountant. They need the internal controls, the checks and balances. A, a clear example is very specifically with the paying of the bills, because Jock, you had that example where money was mm -hmm. paid because they thought it was being, they were being told by the client, is that your workflow needs to include documented approvals as well, using something like bill.com, or I personally use Pluto, which it's built in that nothing can be paid until you have the documented approval from the client. So if the bookkeeper is using the bank's bill pay system, which does not have any of that control in there, um, do you see that, David, that it's a, a lot of times the loss could have been much lessened or even prevented had the bookkeeper or accountant had better internal controls and workflow? Oh, absolutely. But I find it's usually not not your your audience that's the problem. It's usually training the client to 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 abide by the system, and as you said, you know, try and get them not to send the information uh, yes. unsecurely. But um, all of the systems of the uh, of the professional bookkeeper, the freelance bookkeeper, um, are, are for naught if they can't make the clients um, do that. And and I'll tell you. It doesn't matter, uh, from my experience, how bad the client was in in their side of things. When they lose the money, they're going to point the finger straight at uh, straight at the professional that they thought was protecting their back. Yep, yep, irrationally so. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you both. That's much appreciated. So. Last couple questions is over the years, what lessons have you learned that you could pass on, and what's one best action? that our readers and listeners and viewers could follow? I'll, uh, I'll first. I'll, okay, go ahead, David. Yeah, I like David, go. Age before beauty, so go ahead. Oh, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> you can tell they're friends. <laughs> um, the, the, I think the lesson that, that I've learned and I'm trying to impart is um, people see this out there, but um, small and solo practitioners somehow think that because they're so small, they're not a target. And I think that's probably the lesson that I want to, to reach out the most is, you may be more of a target because of your lack of IT infrastructure. Educating yourself on the fact that there is a threat, um, the nomenclature, all these definitions, all these things that we've talked about, they're not things that I knew anything about four or five, six years ago. Um, and I think the, 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 the smaller professionals um, need to take it seriously, learn about it, and then uh, the the best action that I think they can take to recommend is to is to involve themselves in the process of of how do I look at my own system and do something about this? How do I look at the own my workflow and do something about this? I think if they start down that path, one pretty easy to get made afraid of uh, at this point in time, um, pretty easy to get educated, and then um, the steps that they may need to take uh, to protect themselves. If they're thinking about that, they're probably a, a good way towards uh, getting something done in this arena yeah. for themselves. Excellent. And Jack? Yeah, very, very similar thoughts um, that the, the, the solo professional, you're not insulated from cyber threats. You are as, you, yeah, as, as much at risk of suffering a cybersecurity incident as a large organization. And just the, you just have to understand that cyber threats, there's just not one single cyber threat. They are very broad and each one may target a different uh, segment. Uh, you know, the, big, the big ticket item, the, hundred, the millions of records um, of credit card information or social security numbers, that's one piece. The ransomware, they don't really care if you're a large organization or a mm. small organization. In fact, it's it's getting getting a thousand bucks. It it it's it's just that shotgun uh, uh, approach where they try to lock down uh, the bad actor locks down your system. 
give me a thousand bucks in Bitcoin and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move on. And out of the hundreds of thousands of email addresses that they, uh, that they, uh, that they send and they try to uh, penetrate and get you to open the malware, it's a couple, a couple of bytes. So in, on an aggregated basis, it adds up and the, the individuals with the lower security standards and the lesser uh, awareness um, are the ones that are, that, 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 that are under threat. Um, as, as I mentioned before, after, after this, uh, after watching and, and listening, you know, spend 15, 20 minutes just doing some basic research of like, hey, who's, who's, who's a local IT vendor who I can uh, call on? Who's an expert uh, in this field in the event something uh, does happen? I'm not saying you need to draw up a, uh, a huge incident uh, security uh, response uh, 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 protocol, but just think about it. It's that general kind of awareness and, uh, uh, and, uh, and understanding of, hey, this threat, uh, these threats are real. I'm preparing uh, by doing these uh, these things, and in the event something happens, I've at least thought about it uh, uh, previously. Yes, yes. Well, thank you both very much. Much appreciated. So I will say thank you, and I will ask each of you. So, if any of our readers have additional questions or they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way they can do that, Jock? Uh, phone eight five nine three two seven five five nine four. Uh, or email address uh, jock, J O C K dot walls, W O L S, at myriskdesk.com. Very good. And we'll include that with this uh, video post as well. And what about you, David? Same phone number 859 296 2300, or find us on the web at Kincaid and Stills uh, uh, in Google. It's ksattorneys.com, and our profiles are on there. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you both very much. Very much appreciate you taking your time today. Uh, you're both busy professionals yourself, so it's been a huge help, and together I think we're going to help mitigate some of the risks that uh, accountants and bookkeepers are facing. So thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. So. It's been good. Okay. And turn off the recording. All right.